Chai tea has never made sense to me. In Hindi, chai means tea, but more than that, chai from a chai wala on the streets of India is a thick, sweet, syrupy, warm drink that carries the taste of the aluminum pot it was brewed in. Tea, on the other hand, is loose. The drink itself is thin like water, loose in texture and taste, yet potent and if left too long to steep, bitter. Chai tea is therefore both the same word twice, yet two complete opposites residing side by side on the same line. Out of confusion, opposition, and combination, a new third drink is born, thick and loose, sweet and potent at the same time. The result is something that is neither chai nor tea, but both simultaneously. The border between the United States and Mexico presents itself in the same way. As a line of text houses the pseudo-opposites, chai and tea, lines drawn as borders create dualities from the same elements. In the United States, there is the border. In Mexico, there is la frontera. In the US, there is the Rio Grande. In Mexico, there is the Rio Bravo. Sometimes it's even the same word. In the US, there is the city of Nogales, Arizona. In Mexico, there is the city of Nogales, Sonora. The semantics, the meaning, and the navigation of these places changes depending on the side of the border one chooses to call their own and to call the latter the other. This version of the story is told through crossing the border from one side to another, from the United States to Mexico, or from Mexico to the United States. In a sense, this is the narrative that most people will already know about the border, that it divides and separates two nations. Spatial characteristics, economic policies, political devices, environmental phenomenon, and cinematic effects all assume roles in the story to hold up the fiction of the narrative. At the end, people remain polarized on the subject and divided amongst one another, as the writers of the story intended for borders to do from the very beginning. <laughs> Yet, the line of the border is often never seen like a line of text and read from left to right and the third story of the borderlands goes untold. In choosing to tell the story from left to right through the architectural cross-section, the jury is invited to reorient themselves to the possibility of a new reading of the same elements. Traversing the border as a route addresses the life that exists amongst the polarity of two peripheries and two cultures pushed up against each other, which from the confusion, opposition, and combination have been able to be both and neither simultaneously. The acknowledgement of connection is in it of itself enough to transgress the intended purpose of a border to separate and divide. In this version of the story, the border exists, but it exists in a completely different way. Both versions are productions of the same territory, chosen to be viewed through different lenses and cropped to omit parts that don't serve the narrative. On one side is the story of all of the spatial conditions because of the border. This is the architecture that exists in coherency with division and the myths. On the other side is the story of the spatial conditions despite the border. This is the architecture that has occurred in consequence to liminality in life. First are walls. Within the architecture of the border, there is no other wall other than this one. But within the architecture of the borderlands, another form of wall occurs. Because the border should divide two nations, the wall has been built. However, despite the border having been drawn across these coordinates, the mountains have carried across indigenous peoples, local animals, and native vegetation from north to south across the territory since before colonization. Gloria Anzaldúa wrote the canonical text on borderlands in which she outlined the term Nepantla as the journey of living as a Chicano between two cultures of the U.S. and Mexico. However, the term Nepantla, which comes from Nahuatl, is first mentioned in the Florentine Codex, the document that remembers the journey of the Aztecs from Aztlan in the north of Utah down to Mexico City. The term Anzaldúa and many Chicana activists have used after to describe the edge of the borderlands originally ran adjacent to the border and still does today, in constant contrast with the narrative of division. The border wall separates people and connects the border, while the mountains divide the border and connect people. Second are windows. In the architecture of the border, windows are a manifestation of the colonial gaze replicated through modern nation-state narrative building and exercised under the hegemony of ocular centricism. The objectified result of seeing Mexico through a window in the border wall ranges from the yellow filter that is added on to scenes of the country in films to other conditions like in the 1997 film The Game, where scenes of Mexicali were shot by a film crew in Calexico, on the US side, by literally poking the camera through holes in the chaining fence. Contrastingly, in a similar way to Plasma's critique on ocular centricism, the windows of the borderlands are the things that are experienced through the other four senses after sight. Here, the smell of hot dogs and tacos, or the sound of pop songs and mariachis, form the windows to understanding another's culture, at a level where differences exist but cannot detain. After comes the floor. Because of the intention to create a border, the desert between the US and Mexico is weaponized and becomes the border itself. 
Today, private investment, both emotional and financial, remain a strong environment for the border to thrive, with millions of dollars being spent out of pocket to build private fences and surveillance towers, as well as the government turning a blind eye to the thousands of private citizens who call themselves Minutemen and travel to the desert to hunt migrating crossers for sport. In this battlefield, the line of the border hardly seems to matter when the thing to cross is miles of desert territory. In comparison, the floor of the borderlands relies on miles of land that sit in limbo, south of the U.S. border wall and north of the border drawn on the map. The land titled No Man's Land exists all along the border where the wall could not be built on the edge of the Rio Grande. This floor and the borderland individuals that reside on it themselves ask what it means to be a U.S. citizen and live below the wall which people often claim to be the border itself. After are the doors. Here, cattle doors are built into the wall in order to permit 500 million pounds of beef that passes from Mexico to the U.S. and back every year. Cattle and beef currently move across North America without any tariffs or quotas. There are currently three cattle gates along the border in Texas where cows start as Mexicans and leave as Americans. The cows are inspected by USDA agents in lieu of U.S. Customs and Border Patrol agents and will go from being a $30 straw of steer sperm going from the U.S. to Mexico into a cow that is sold at $800 to a U.S. farmer who sells to a slaughterhouse for $1,600 to meat that is retailed for $3,500 amounting to three border crossings in the life of just one cow. On the other hand, the border is again nullified when it crosses through private properties stretching between the two territories. In these cases, doors are built into the border wall in the backyards of generational landowners who themselves hold private access codes and can and must pass through the border to reach parts of their own homes. We have five minutes or else the doors crush us. The articulation of these elements begin to expose the produced narrative of the border and its ability to be redefined and redetermined. These conditions bring into context the completeness of the architecture of the border. Beyond a single wall, it is a full construct as well as its consequences expressed through the architecture of the borderlands. The study of the border through the lens of architectural elements continues by examining roofs of the border as a capture and surveillance in the air of birds migrating across North America to the extensions of the border into detention centers as a result of the violent tactics implemented to halt migrants and refugees stopped from completing their intended journeys. To support these roofs and the architecture of the border are columns manifested through the 43 checkpoints that scatter the line. Some present themselves as strange, almost harmless anomalies like the minuscule city of Antelope Wells, New Mexico, where the only residents are U.S. Customs and Border Protection agents that work at the checkpoint and live behind it. A friend recounts his experiences crossing from Mexicali to Calexico. Vamos en carro. Mis papás saben que que piden siempre un chorro de documentos porque no es la primera vez que pedían este pa, esta visa. Yo iba cada año iba a Disneylandia. Pues es, es algo normal. Entonces fuimos y Como te dije la otra vez, depende del policía que te toca. Mis papás llevan todos los papeles y, ah, sí, muy bien, muy bien, muy bien. Y le dicen, ¿y los niños van a la escuela? Y era la primera vez que le preguntaban eso a mis papás. Y sí, sí, van a la escuela, ok, tienen que probarlo. Bueno, tuvimos que regresar y el policía es este que está dice, ¿a dónde van? Ah, Nuevo México. Oh, Nuevo México, wow, oh, me encanta Nuevo México. Y, y empieza a hablar con mis papás de tonterías mientras está sellando los papeles y ah sí me encanta que tengan buenas vacaciones no pidió ni un solo papel these artifices of profiling and non-acceptance hold their narrative well but so do the columns of the architecture of the borderlands remittance houses the majestic makes homes result as architectural consequences of migrants who send money and directions of how to build homes back to relatives in mexico the combination of American houses they see around them and the act of having to relay construction instructions over telephone transform into domestic scale materializations of the migrant voyage and stand as proud reminders of the transgressive community that persists despite the border. This song is called La Bestia, and it was written by the U.S. Customs and Border Protection under a multi-million dollar initiative to stop migration from Central America on the migrant cargo train nicknamed La Bestia. It is one of the most popular and frequently requested songs in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, currently being played across 21 radio stations in Central America. 
La Bestia itself represents the ways of circulation brought to fruition because of the border as a solely cargo train route that now carries thousands of migrants on its roof from the southern border to the northern border every day. In comparison, highways and roads continue to stitch together the borderland territory despite having been torn apart by propaganda and narrative building. Finally, functional aspects of the border and borderlands only further each architecture's prowess to exist. Water is enacted through the weaponization of the river as a natural extension of the border, while the ocean acts as a breaking point where the border only fails to pass. The plumbing of the architecture remains in the tunnels, dug because of the impossible circumstances provided by the overground border, while these routes of exalt are expressed in the form of the everyday routes that inhabitants of the borderlands take on a daily basis. Both routes are powered by the electricity of the architectures. For the nation-state border, policies of economy provide the impetus for citizens from all corners of both countries to attempt to cross the border for striking differences in everyday commodities and essentials like medical care. From another perspective, love, friendship, family, and community stir an immense need to transgress where one is repeatedly told not to. In Mexico, the word Guajiro translates to an impossible dream. Lo Guajiro is both distant yet close to the heart, sweet yet potent, troubled yet empowering, unlikely yet dreamt of. For many, crossing the border against all odds is a sueño Guajiro, which makes the border an architecture Guajira or an architecture dreamed. But between surreal spaces, strange anomalies, covert thresholds, enraging incoherencies, and love stories between bars, the border can not only continue to be told as a place of division, sacrilege, and poverty, when the depth of the identity of transnational is more than that. In all of its paradoxicalness, unfolded, these elements form two worlds, superimposed onto each other, as the architecture because of the border and the architecture despite the border. While the border itself is composed of these elements and the enforcement of itself, the power of the architecture of the border comes from the aggrandizement of architecture seen as monuments, when instead they should be talked about as just that, elements of architecture. The isolated elements derivative of the border's spatial, social, economic, political, and environmental conditions, they themselves form familiar terms. When the elements are removed from their current spatial arrangement as a line that forms a border, the architecture can be recontextualized through lived and experienced reappropriation. As with semantic saiation, where saying a word repeatedly over and over again subdues the brain's chemical reaction to it and renders it meaningless, the repetition of the architecture of the border in different scales, orientations, places, and situations quells the monumentalism of the border and breaks open the false concept of a linear narrative. Through reinterpreting the story, the architecture becomes alive and seeks to subvert our attached meanings of these walls, windows, doors, floors, exchanging old patterns of fear, sacrifice, and loss for new rhythms of pride, mischief, and acceptance. There is something ominous about the wall, and perhaps it is the fact that it is the only wall in the world that looks like that. The recasting of it, of all the elements, without the intention to separate or divide, strips the border of its symbolism and consequentially also seeks to catalyze the coexistent architecture of the borderlands without a border, beyond a border. The borderlands, to be transnational, the idea to connect and encounter with what and who's across the line, are all examples of how placing a border might define two territories, yet in the same act, a third unexpected place is conceived. A territory of in-betweenness, a space of liminality that can be found in dialogue with borders and is continuously redefined through its inhabitants. On one hand, impossible dreams carry with them loss, pain, and suffering. But on the other hand, they create dreamers out of us in an architecture dreamed.